of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cena. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cena. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, October 6, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Ed Bermila, author of Chaotic Neutral, how the Democrats lost their soul in the center. Meanwhile, Herschel Walker says he doesn't know the woman who showed receipts of the abortion that he paid for, allegedly. But turns out she's the mother of one of his children. Still not ringing a bell. (laughs) My ears are ringing, though. OPEC has decided to cut oil production in an effort to raise prices at the pump and make more money, but also help Russia. This is price gouging and it's criminal cartel stuff, but it's legal and also we're dependent on it. In response, the Biden administration is releasing some of its reserves and is reportedly looking into easing sanctions on Venezuela so Chevron can resume pumping there. Less sanctions on Venezuela is a good thing. A federal appeals court has expedited consideration of the DOJ's efforts to shut down the special master review of the top secret documents Trump stole. The new schedule sets a deadline for mid-November, but after the midterms. A federal appeals court also has denied uh, or I should say, declared DACA illegal. The 600,000 Dreamers currently here will not be affected, but it bars the Biden administration from processing others under the program. And you will be shocked to hear that it's mostly a Republican-appointed appeals court. In the UK, hundreds of thousands of nurses have voted to go on strike for better pay increases. There is still time to avoid the strike if the wages are increased before that happens. Speaking of the UK, new PM Liz Truss is facing protests over her tax cuts for the wealthy proposals and pro-fossil fuel initiatives. Putin has published a decree declaring Europe's largest nuclear power plant, with, which is within Ukraine, to be under Russian control. Not good, given some of the rhetoric coming out of the Kremlin in regards to nuclear annihilation. (laughs) And lastly, a new study has found that the severe drought the world has been seeing over the past summer was made 20 times more likely by climate change. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome to the show, everybody. Happy Emma Majority Report Thursday. Uh, if you celebrated Yom Kippur yesterday, hope you had a lovely holiday. Um, haven't talked to Sam, but hopefully he did. People are saying he's quite quitting in the chat. Well, I mean... Um, this is maybe the first week, I don't know, that you've done over half of the shows. W- w- without it being pre-planned right. for him being on vacation or something point. like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you're you are tipping our hand about the coup that we've been planning, good sir. So keep it quiet. Uh, stop John Boltoning all over the place. But Sam will also be in Vegas next week. But he's going to be calling in at certain points. I'm I'm forgetting what the schedule is, Bradley or Matt. Like, do you I guys mean, he know? might be on a lot. I'm not sure. Um, he is. He won't be on Monday through Wednesday, but Thursday for Thursday and Friday he will be on. Ah. Oh, well, that's funny. That's different. The, the old days he used to do every day from uh, Vegas. So well, he's got to, to enjoy more recreation. <laughs> some of his time there. I wonder where he's staying. Um, I've like mentioned this before. I really liked Vegas when I went there because every time I went there, I was going there for work, but then I could still enjoy 
thing. So my hotel was paid for. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, but you that makes your experience of cities a lot better. Like Boston was really fun because uh, we weren't paying for it. Right, we weren't paying for the hotel. Yeah, but but Vegas in particular is probably the most expensive city I, I've ever been to, and uh, you notice it a lot less when you are get your your stuff is comped. But um, anyway, I hope Sam has a good time uh, there. I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit jealous. But um, let's talk more about Herschel Walker. I know that. Maybe this story, we kind of know a lot of the gradations here, but I can't stop talking about it. And as you were pointing out before the show, Matt, ads still haven't come out yet. Republic or Democratic opposition hasn't necessarily put their hooks into this yet in terms of like blasting the airwaves in Georgia about this. So talking about it does have value, value besides just being fun. Yeah, they're still talking about like the border and immigrants and, and crime and, and yeah hurricane and stuff. they're going hard on the, on the crime angle right. and um herschel walker he uh he went uh, he's been doing a media blitz trying to respond to uh the daily beast reporting on this and i think the Meg- daily beast the left his own son yeah <laughs> and his his son just putting it all out there like i, I am um Megyn Kelly was right that I think that they were clearly holding on to this piece of information for the October surprise. But, hey, I'm happy uh, well, that we funny, do it because it, the Fox News engages in po- politicking with their reporting all the time. So I'm happy if the Daily Beast is going to do it for our, our purposes. But one thing that's funny is like they might be wrong about which abortion payment was being held on for the October surprise because Herschel can't really identify who this is. And there might be more than one. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, yeah, TBD. But um, he's so he's having to go on and defend this. The new uh, angle, as I mentioned in the headlines, uh, that's that's come out in the Daily Beast is that Herschel Walker was claiming he doesn't know who the woman was who's making the allegations and how it's all false. But uh, basically, without revealing her identity, the Daily Beast has said, no, this is one of the women he has a children. He has a a child with. So pretty clear. (laughs) He knows <laughs> who she is. Um, that doesn't prove anything. So, <laughs> right. I mean, but if, for him, like, it, it's a little mo- l- less clear. But uh, here he is on Hugh Hewitt's show talking about th- this new wrinkle in the Daily Beast reporting on this. And um, he, it just slips out here that abortions are nothing to be ashamed of. But dude, you've said you're in favor of a federal ban and a ban with no exceptions for rape. Yeah. Um, also, a g- smart of them to use a still instead of a video uh, interview here. Where he does that weird smile <laughs> the whole time. All right. Again, Herschel, the Daily Beast has updated the story about your paying for a woman's abortion. Uh, the anonymous woman has now also alleged that she had a child by you. Your response? Uh, I'll say it was the same thing I said, that, uh, you know, I know this is untrue. And I know it's untrue. And they keep telling me things like that, and it's totally, totally untrue. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not sure why uh, that will be told. I know nothing about any woman having an abortion. And, and uh, so they can, they can keep coming at me like that. And, and they're doing it because uh, they want to distract people. I know that because, you know, I've already been forgiven. And if I've been forgiven, why in the world will I not be forgiven of something yeah, like, wait, like that? Hold on, hold on. And I'm not so, saying being he, forgiven. Sorry, yeah, thank you, Bradley. Um, the uh, he's already He keeps saying he's already been forgiven. Doesn't it matter who's be doing the forgiving? And what because, are you being forgiven for? Right, and that too. Right. <laughs> well, he's been. I've been forgiven for everything else, like holding a gun to God my wife. God gave me head. a blanket pardon over anything I might have done. He's. Uh, God has preemptively pardoned me, like Trump. Um, but but that is. Anyway, it's just another point where he keeps saying I've been forgiven, and it's like. Well, you know what that is. I know it's 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 religious. Code to the yeah, religious people being like. Did you see? The, I think there's like footage of like. Uh, he was with a bunch of evangelicals and they were putting their hands on him and praying with him like the morning after his son is like, hey, can you wear a condom, please? Yeah, right. Um, there is like a, a also just a weird undertone of of like the, the racial element of it, too, that I find that's very strange, um, yeah. disturbing. But I right, keep going. And abortion and uh, so they, they can keep coming at me like that. It, 
and they're doing it because uh, they want to distract Pause it, sorry, just <laughs> They meaning, again, like not just like the reporters of the Daily Beast, but also your a, kid. Fa- a woman who mothered a child of yours. <laughs> and then also could have mothered another ch- ch- uh, child of yours, but you, she exercised her right over her own health care, and you yeah. helped her For out. For some reason, she thought maybe one child with Herschel Walker is <laughs> yeah. enough children with Herschel Walker. I'm not going to do this another time. <laughs> know that because you know i've already been forgiven and if i've been forgiven why in the world would i not be forgiven of something i like that and i'm not so, saying being forgiven go ahead is there anything you need to be forgiven for vis-a-vis a woman whose name we do not know do you know who this woman is and do you need to <laughs> oh, be forgiven well that's that's what's so funny and i'm saying i've been forgiven because of all the things i did when i went to my when I, the thing with my ex-wife and all that and things I did, I don't know how many years ago that I wrote in my book. I said, guys, I wasn't perfect. I had my problem with mental health. And I've, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've been, I've, I've, I've been, I've, I've been born again, but I, I have a new life. And I've, I've been moving As forward. And, you know, <laughs> and if that had happened, I would have I said it. There you was know, nothing to be ashamed of there. You know, people have done that, but... I know nothing yeah, about it. Not and, sure. uh, if I knew about it, I, I would be honest and talk about it. Sure. But I know nothing about that. <laughs> oh my God. Wait, did, did, did I miss it? I'm sorry. I was like checking out this ad. He said that thing about how there's nothing to be ashamed right of, the end right? There, yeah. Okay. Can just go back a little bit because it, it, he's. I mean, he's mumbling, and I'm I'm having a hard time figuring it he's out. He's trying to buy your own logic, liberals. But it's like, yeah, we don't think it's something to be ashamed of, but that's not the biggest problem. It's something that should be legal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I have a new life, and I've, I've been moving forward. And and, uh, and and if that had happened, I would I would have said it because there's nothing to be ashamed of. There we there. go. Right. Okay. You know, people have done that. But so people have done that. If it's murder, is that something that you shouldn't be ashamed of? And people have done that, right? Yeah. And you helped. You paid for it. That's what you did. Um. <laughs> so if if I did pay for the abortion, that would be nothing to be ashamed of. But you're literally trying to make it illegal. So then, what is the point? If something is not shameful, then it shouldn't be illegal. Yeah. I mean. The left isn't upset that people are shaming people about abortions. That's a byproduct. The left is upset because it's not a lot. It's not being provided as a course of uh, health care. Yeah. Uh, and, and the fact that you're actively trying to campaign on making it illegal. Like, it's just... Uh, but nothing to be ashamed of. Herschel Walker, let's put it on a poster. Abortion. Nothing, no, to, nothing be ashamed to be ashamed of. of. Thank you. Um, my, just seems a little inconsistent, and I would be so sympathetic to his discussions about his mental health if it wasn't just a complete, like, fig leaf for his own, yeah. uh, just desire to not have any accountability, because it does seem like he has some brain trauma, it seems like, I don't know, I'm not his doctor from I mean, playing football. statistically speaking, It would make a lot of sense, also based on how he acts, it would make a lot of sense, yeah, some of the volatility output, yeah. in his back, in his background, but... Like, I don't really have much sympathy because you're actively trying to take am- away my rights. <laughs> no, it's clearly he's exploiting that, the, what he's supposedly apologized for and moved beyond um, as a dodge against these new allegations, which are fun. And it, again, it, it doesn't make any sense to say, hey, uh, a woman who has one of your children said you uh, paid for her to get an abortion is like, I, look, I had mental health issues. Like, that that doesn't follow. That's yeah, a non sequitur. I, I, and... Honestly, based on the stuff that has come up in his past, if he wasn't running as a Senate candidate, this is actually one of the kindest things that Herschel Walker has done, which is pay for the abortion that his uh, girlfriend wanted. At the very least, yeah. Yeah. So it's like the in a vacuum, the least problematic thing that Herschel Walker has done. But within the context of trying to take the right to choose away, pretty bad. It's to be a senator. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... If if I was completely cynical, having him in the Senate for the lols would be. But I mean the content from the a content, content perspective from a yeah, content you're perspective, right. like it's like when Trump was in office. But uh, from a future like you know legal structure are, of the country, it's problematic. It's but. really bad. Yes, we we should do all we can to make sure he does not get into the Senate. That's why we're starting with it once again. Today. Yes. Um, before we head into uh, our, our discussion with Ed Bermila, we have a message from one of our sponsors. 
Did you know that incognito mode d- doesn't hide your activity? I mean, yeah, but just that, that's that's Some, just somebody a, like what? Yeah, guys, <laughs> just like if you're putting on incognito <laughs> mode go. to to Google some things that you. Yeah, it's it's not going to work out. You got to get more serious about it. It doesn't matter how many times Matt you clear Walsh your like, brow. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Walsh, you paying attention? You could use this. Doesn't matter how many times you clear your browsing history, your internet service provider can still see every single website you've ever visited and legally sell your information to ad companies. It's unreal. That is why you need ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so ISP can't see the sites that you visit. ExpressVPN keeps all of your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. ExpressVPN runs seamlessly in the background and is so easy to use. All you have to do is tap one button and you're protected. ExpressVPN is available on all of your devices, phones, computers, even your smart TV, so there's no excuse not to use it. Now, I mean, hey, look, I've uh, used ExpressVPN before to uh, look at some sports games or things where I could sports use it. Sports blackouts are insane. Yeah. It's Especially in New York because you get the two uh, you get two teams in a lot of these, like the Nets and Knicks. Right. And the Jets Yankees and, Giants and, and Yankees and Mets. Mets. You yeah. have to have those networks. Yeah. Right. Um, but if you want to say you're someone like me and you... Uh, <clears throat> like to wager on, on, on sports and you want to watch the game uh, so you can feel the misery as your bet loses, you need something like ExpressVPN. It runs easy, easily and seamlessly, and you can just plug it in. Protect your online activity today with the VPN rated number one by Business Insider and by myself. Visit my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash majority, and you can get an extra three months free three months free on a one-year package that's express e x p r e s s vpn dot com slash majority express vpn dot com slash majority to learn more all right we're going to take a quick break and when we come back we'll be joined by ed bermila
We are back, and we are joined uh, via phone by Ed Bermilla, author of Chaotic Neutral, How the Democrats Lost Their Soul in the Center. Ed, uh, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Of course. Um, so, uh, Chaotic Neutral, that gave us uh, a bit of a chuckle here in the studio. What was what was the genesis of, of that idea and how you wanted to kind of uh, f frame frame your book and this critique of the Democratic Party from where it was as a New Deal style party to where it's become what it's become. Well, the neutral part the neutral part is self explanatory, I think, and I did warn my publisher that I was not prepared to field any Dungeons and Dragons related questions because <laughs> I understand chaotic neutral is a reference to it, but that is the sum total extent of my D and D knowledge. So no disrespect for the game or anything. It's uh, just never been a thing I got into. So I was sold on the idea of, um, you know, chaotic, the, the idea that they're always flailing around for some kind of solution, but always settling back on essentially the same prescription for every problem, which is let's move toward the center. Right. Um, and this is something that I think our audience is probably intimately familiar with, given our critiques of the Democratic Party. But what your book does right. is it provides a historical context for those critiques. So I guess let's let's really start at the beginning about um, where the the modern Democratic Party began to take shape under FDR, can you can you talk about the some of the coalitions uh, that that FDR was able to win over and how it, it it shaped the context by which we view our disappointment and frustration with the Democratic Party uh, since right. since the sixties really. Right. I, I think that it's pretty well-trodden ground, so I didn't want to linger on it excessively in, in chaotic neutral, but you have to understand what the starting point is in order to make sense of the, the modern, the current Democratic Party. And, you know, there is a sense in Democratic circles of always looking back on the glory years of the New Deal era, where FDR had been able to assemble a coalition based on meeting people's direct material needs, um, you know, during the Great Depression and continuing to build a robust social welfare state after the Second World War helped pull the country out of the Depression. And at that point in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, the Democratic Party, as it became more liberal on issues having to do with race and civil rights, as well as women's liberation, the burgeoning gay rights movement in the 1970s, all of these things, uh, you know, the narrative is that it began to alienate a certain kind of hard hat wearing white working class voter. Uh, the problem with that narrative, as I explain in the book, is that what happened simultaneously to the Democratic Party becoming more liberal on issues like civil rights and race was also that they started to become decidedly more conservative on issues that had to do with economics. And we can't look at the Democratic Party's failure today to be able to successfully reach out to working class voters um, without understanding those two moves. The only thing we ever hear about is that, well, um, wokeness is killing the mm -hmm. Democrats. You know, they're too liberal on these socials. We hear that from James Carville. You know, he emerges every other day to remind us that uh, the Democratic Party is now too woke. Uh, the problem, as I frame it, is not that, uh, you know, simply there was this move to become more liberal on what we now call social issues, but there's been a, a steady uh, move to the right on economic policy. They've embraced neoliberalism. They've embraced free trade. They've embraced markets as the solution to everything. And we can't understand the struggles to win over that, you know, mythical working class, a white working class voter today without understanding that move as well. Yes. I mean, and all of that is is definitely, uh, I, I think, some uh, has been a lot of the focus of uh, our show and the critique uh, of the Democratic Party. But I mean, I guess y y you touched on it very well, but I, I am wondering if you can expand a little bit on that time period um, from FDR to then once once Nixon begins to split the New Deal coalition. Um and and how that how that sets us up for you know we can make our conversation a bit more current after that okay well what happened was that the the democrats started to lose ground with what they saw as their core voter which was 
um, union members, organized labor, working class people. And when they started to lose ground in the 1970s, this group came along in the 1980s, the Democratic Leadership Council, which culminated with one of their key members or two of their key members, Bill Clinton and Al Gore, um, you know, uh, attaining the White House in 1992. And their strategy was that they needed to keep moving forward, meaning in their view, to the right on economic issues. And then the way to appeal to these voters that were no longer happy with the Democratic Party was to start conceding to the right on things like, um, you know, all the things Bill Clinton emphasized, welfare, crime, reinventing government, which just meant kind of downsizing the bureaucracy and things like that. Um, those things were designed to appeal to Democratic voters or former Democratic voters who were no longer happy with the party without going back to any of the kind of social welfare, quote unquote, big government policies that had defined what made the Democratic Party so popular among those voters in the first place. Right, right. Um, and and in terms of some of the lessons that you think maybe the modern Democratic Party might have learned, like um, for me, when I see Nancy Pelosi uh, constantly every it seems like clockwork, right? Uh, every mm -hmm. every few months, it's like she has to do it's like a woman's haircut. You get one. You're supposed to get a, a, a haircut once a season. So for a year. Right. Um for her, that's what my, my mom taught me. For her, it's uh, you have to say uh, four times a year what, uh, uh, how much you want a strong Republican Party. She says right. it constantly. And there's, I, yeah. I, I had like a, a, a tweet, honestly, where I just I searched Pelosi's strong Republican Party, and you just find constant uh -huh. examples of her saying the same quote. And a lot of that yeah. for me is like just this, this complete shell shock and PTSD from the yep. 1980s and this these election losses from that time period. It, is that right. something, do you think that that's a fair assessment of why they're constantly trying to appeal to the right? Well, first of all, it's misguided. The only way in party politics to change the behavior of your opponent is to beat them so badly that they'll have no choice but to change their approach to things. But what you see is this yearning for the Democratic Party to get the Republican Party to agree on norms and traditions of how politics should work. And that ship has sailed. And the Democratic Party is evidenced by people like Pelosi making that comment, which we've all seen. Um, you know, as you mentioned, she surfaces repeatedly to say, gosh, why can't we have a better, stronger Republican Party? It's, um, it's kind of pathetic in a way that they they are they see no way to get the Republican Party to negotiate with them on their terms, on the Democratic Party's terms, how they would prefer to do things. And they don't have an alternative strategy beyond that. Um, they can't they seem incapable or only very slowly willing to kind of accommodate themselves to the reality. Hey, wait, the Republicans aren't going to play the game the way we want them to play the game. What do we do now? Can you talk a bit about how uh, pollsters and polling took over the Democratic Party um, as and by extension consultant culture and how that affected and influenced the dynamic that you describe? Well, one of the problems Democrats have with um, their relationship to public opinion is that they're selectively uh, beholden to it. You know, when polls tell them what they already want to hear, they will point at public opinion and say, ah, see, this is a reason uh, we need to start moving back to the center because liberal or left policies, as they see it, are unpopular. On the other hand, when public opinion tells them, you know, 70 some percent of the country said, yeah, let's have a public option in the ACA. That's something they don't want to do. So then they, they simply disregard it and say, well, we can't do that, even though it's popular, because we'll alienate, you know, the, the two hypothetical moderates that live in Chuck Schumer's imagination. So their relationship to public opinion is inconsistent. And what it boils down to is they use public opinion variously as a reason to do or, you know, something not to do or a reason not to do things that they're already predisposed to want to do. Well, right, because you can learn this from the Republican Party, who's been more successful over the past uh, few decades, certainly, than the Democratic Party, in that uh, abortion rights are incredibly 
popular, mm-hmm. and yet uh, they they wield their power by activating certain coalitions who are aggressively anti-abortion and there seems like there's Mm -hmm. no reciprocal kind of understanding from the democratic side i feel like they're very slowly coming to a realization in in my opinion probably a few years too late uh starting to realize that that's the way abortion politics work we saw in the immediate aftermath of the dobbs decision uh, there was still this residual old bad habit tendency for, for Democratic candidates and, you know, for the White House to say, well, let's not push this thing too far because we might alienate some, you know, pro-life moderates or whatever. And the way to play that issue, because abortion rights are popular, bodily autonomy is a fundamental concept that, you know, uh, most Americans are, 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 are willing to support, is to, is to push that as hard as you can and not worry about who you're going to offend in the minority of Americans who don't support abortion rights. Uh, so hopefully, moving forward, they can start to use that as an effective wedge issue. At the same time, though, they need a concrete plan of what they're going to do to try to protect and restore abortion rights, because right now it's enough to point at the Dobbs decision in the GOP and say, look, they're taking your rights away. But the practical consequence of the Dobbs decision is that people are suffering and people are going to suffer. And if in two years or four years it's become apparent that the Democrats don't have a clear and potentially effective plan to get those rights back and secure and protect them, I think voters are going to start to see the Dobbs-based appeals to come out and vote blue as this, you know, it's going to start to look a little crass in a couple of years. Yes, yeah. I I am also, um, you you write a a good amount about Bill Clinton and, and that time period. Would you say that that is, and the lessons learned from Bill Clinton, who was arguably a more effective, like, pro market uh, uh, <laughs> politician than. He was a better Reagan than Reagan. <laughs> I mean, expand on that if you don't mind, Ed. Well, he got more of Reagan's agenda accomplished and embraced by the majority in Washington, D.C. than Reagan was able to ultimately. Bill Clinton was the Democrat who kind of signaled the surrender to the right and to these newly popular, well, newly popular at the time, neoliberal economic theories. And he wanted to make it clear to everybody, and he did, that the Democratic Party was no longer the party of trusting government, and no longer the party of big government, no longer the party of welfare, no longer the party of what the right characterized as being soft on crime. So it really was a surrender to the Republican Party and agreeing to fight these battles on their terms and say, well, yes, of course, we know government needs to be smaller. We know big government is bad. We know uh, the budget deficit or, you know, things like that are suddenly the most important issue anybody's ever heard of in politics. And it really was agreeing to fight on the ground that the Republican Party chose. And it's no surprise that they've been only partially effective with the message of, yes, the Republicans are fundamentally right about this, but you need Democrats in charge because we will accomplish these same goals, but better and smarter. How does uh, the way that the Democratic Party has, uh, how has their relationship with the Supreme Court, um, I think, uh, how does that fit into, into your critique? A very, very, very belated and slow realization that the court is another instrument of power politics. It's not this objective institution where, um, you know, the idealized liberal worldview of how the Supreme Court works is that there's deliberation and ultimately some sort of decision based on agreed upon norms and principles. And right now, what you see is that the Republicans see the Supreme Court as a super legislature that can't be checked. And their legal theory or their constitutional theory and, you know, interpretation is essentially Calvin Ball. They will just make up whatever they need to at any given moment to achieve the political outcome and the policy outcome that they want. And that is just now uh, starting to sink in. And the Democratic strategy for the federal courts as I talk about in the final chapter in Chaotic Neutral, has been bad for a long time. Um, It's not one thing or one problem or 
Merrick Garland's failed nomination is not, you know, the, the single piece of the puzzle that changes everything. They have been lagging behind the rights in terms of um, an organized process of churning out right wing justices ideologically committed to specific political outcomes for a long time. And the Democratic Party is just now, I think, starting to realize, hey, wait, it doesn't matter what powerful arguments are made in <laughs> front of the Supreme Court. These six justices see their job as legislating and they're going to do it because they now have the power to do it. And uh, as things stand right now, nobody can stop them. I find the uh, one of the things most grating uh, about the Democratic Party's ineffectiveness is how they're um, and perhaps, you, as you say, maybe they're coming around to it now, but how their uh, re- almost religious, like fanatical commitment to norms gets in the way of yeah. the, any of, of actually wielding power when possible. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you see the tail end of this, the extreme version is somebody like Senator Sinema. Um, you know, who, who seems open about the fact that, look, the most important thing in the world to her is apparently the filibuster, you know. Um, and while Democrats have drummed into their voters' heads for 30 years now, you have to be willing to compromise on everything. You can't have litmus tests and purity tests. I think at this point, the Democratic Party could benefit from some additional purity tests, starting with when we have power, should we govern? Right. And uh, you saw in the Connor Lamb versus John Fetterman primary for the Senate seats in Pennsylvania, uh, which Fetterman won pretty handily the nomination contest. uh, You saw a, a clear choice that voters were presented with. Here's this guy that we can all easily picture being the third member of a mansion cinema and lamb troika. And here's Fetterman, whose basic message didn't have anything to do with him wearing cargo shorts or being a cool dude or whatever. His basic message was, I'll be the 51st vote, right? And you want people um, in the party who are going to be pulling the rope in the same direction at the same time when they have the chance to do so. Because when a party will have the opportunity to exercise power in a two-party system, it's unpredictable. Things will go back and forth. There will be periods of divided government. But when you have all of it, when you have unified control, you have to have a coalition that's willing to govern at that point. And we've seen too often over the past couple of decades, they've de-emphasized that in favor of, well, all that matters is that we get the majority. Then they get majorities and they're unable to hold them for very long because the coalition they've assembled doesn't agree on enough basic issues you know, the, the most basic one being, should we govern or should we allow all these rules that the Republicans successfully wield against us to take precedence? I mean, how how do you think Watergate uh, influenced influenced some of these tendencies uh, for, for this like current generation of, frankly, uh, ossified uh, Democratic leadership? Yeah, the Watergate was, uh, you know, a, a monumental event politically in a lot of different ways. One of the things that I talk about in the book and that uh, Julian Zelizer, the historian, has written a full book about uh, Newt Gingrich and his um, battle with Democratic Speaker Jim Wright in the late 1980s. Ultimately, Gingrich was able to topple Wright on ethics charges, which is funny if you know what happened to G- Newt Gingrich after yeah. that. But The idea uh, that Watergate really changed a lot of things in Congress by bringing in this new generation, who I talk about in uh, one of my chapters, the the Watergate babies, and their uh, their view of uh, politics had a lot to do with reform of the institutions away from the old school back scratching four cocktails at lunch sort of ways of Washington. And former Speaker Jim Wright was a creature of that. And ultimately, the Republican Party was able to leverage that against him. Find, uh, you know, if we look hard enough, we will find some kind of rules violation for any sitting member of Congress. Sort of like if one's boss wants to fire you, they can always dig deep enough and find some, you know, minor rule that you violated or whatever. And uh, that, that Watergate mentality brought people like Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton into politics, this polished suit and tie, highly educated, um, you know, Oxford, advanced degrees, that kind of person suddenly became the norm in politics. 
Whereas before that, that was far from the norm in Congress. Some people were very highly educated. Other people had very little formal education and their whole career was essentially as a political apparatchik. They didn't spend time working in banks and for McKinsey and teaching at Harvard and all this other kind of stuff. They were representatives. That was their stock and trade. And they saw their their position as one where wielding power and influence was the key, following rules that were set out about who can and can't pay for lunch when you're at dinner with a lobbyist was irrelevant to them. And it was ultimately their downfall because it left open, uh, you know, attacks from this new reformist generation of people who wanted to pass things like sunshine laws and reform the inner workings of Congress in the 1970s. Um, that change was ultimately probably for the better, but as you point out, yeah, there have been consequences to that. It's changed the character of how things work in Washington. It's changed the character of what kind of person ends up in Congress. And yes, yeah, certainly. And it also, I think, um, you know, it, it when, when that kind of perspective is dominant, it leaves the door open for someone like Donald Trump, who um, yeah. who who it doesn't it, who seems outside who seems or brands oneself as outside of of that culture. If that makes sense to you, Ed? Yeah, it does. Donald Trump was um, it, it, he was kind of a magician in the sense that he himself is obviously an elite. He's a rich, famous white old man from New York City, real estate developer, but he had so many grievances about the way other elites treated him that he managed to come off as sincerely anti-elitist, if you want to phrase it that way. So he had this kind of anti-elitism, but it was of the New York page six variety, mm -hmm. you know, where he was upset that because he was uncouth and he was crass and he was loud and tacky, that other elites disdained him. And he had all these petty resentments built up against him. But he was able to, on the campaign trail, portray that as some sort of uh, or, or pass it off to voters as a kind of sincere anti-elitism. We know that he was anything but. He governed like any other Republican plutocrat would govern. Um, and, and he simply... Uh, was able to make his, you know, enormous sense of personal grievance connect with voters who also didn't like some of those same people. Right. Um, I know you, you touched on this a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could expand on how the, uh, the undercutting of unions beginning in uh, the 1970s and continuing to uh, basically for unions to, to bleed membership um, mm -hmm. and like this uh, culminating in like the, the 90s end of history uh, mm -hmm. perspective, H how that changed the, the Democratic Party leadership based on the constituencies that they were no longer beholden to given uh, union decline in terms of power. Right. Well, there's a guy named Al Fromm who founded or co-founded the Democratic Leadership Council, which eventually throughout the 80s and into the early 90s gave rise to this new moderate generation of Democrats like Bill Clinton. And he was viciously anti-union. His argument was, and this was embraced by people like Bill Clinton in his circle, that unions um, represent industries of the past that are going to go away. Uh, I'm not sure how old you are, Emma, but I'm old enough to remember the debates about NAFTA and things like that in the early 90s, where the Democratic argument, which he because he was a masterful communicator, Bill Clinton managed to convince people was plausible. The argument was, look, these jobs you've held for your life or, you know, you expect to hold for the rest of your life are going to go away. It's inevitable. Globalization is coming. Nobody can do anything to stop it. So jobs where you use your back and your muscles are going to disappear. But don't worry, through the miracle of education and training, which will solve anything, you'll have even better jobs in a few years, right? So the right. Democratic view through the 1980s, according to the, the people who saw the world the way Bill Clinton did, was we're going to lose union support, but it doesn't matter because these whole industries are something of the past. They're irrelevant. They're anachronisms. They're going to disappear. So our fading support among blue-collar workers in yellow plastic hard hats 
is ultimately not going to matter because the economy is changing in a way where this new kind of voter we do strongly appeal to, people like architects and people with jobs like consultants who live in the suburbs and do very well financially and have multiple college degrees. That's the future. And instead, what we have seen, of course, in reality is that the promise of everybody who had a good factory job now having some other kind of even better job where they use a desk and a computer did not come true. But in 1992, especially because Bill Clinton was such a good communicator compared to an old stiff like George H.W. Bush, he was able to convince enough people, yes, this sounds plausible. The rust belt is getting rusty, but in the future, we'll, we'll not miss it because we'll have something even better to replace it. Now, 30 years down the line, people are no longer willing to buy the story that, you know, something better is coming to replace it. Right. And I mean, that, that I think, uh, is inherent in the, the way that trade deals and free trade have become like, there's been a collective understanding of what they've done to the country and the backlash of that yeah. ensues. And you can't have, you can't be a president, a presidential candidate on either side of the aisle at this point. Um, Hillary Clinton had to walk back her support, for example, for the TPP, although however insincere that was. Um, yeah. but, but you cannot uh, be a candidate running on the national stage right now and support free trade uh, to the extent that, I mean, that is a rapid change in political understanding from that of, you know, when NAFTA was initially signed in the 90s. Right. And in 2016, a lot of people, you know, observers of the election had a hard time understanding how Donald Trump was getting traction with that. But as somebody who, you know, I'm from Illinois, I spent most of my life there. I lived for seven years in Peoria, Illinois, you know, one of those poster childs for deindustrial, poster children, can't believe I just said childs, uh, poster children for deindustrialization. People there are very, very receptive to an argument that's unsophisticated and simple and superficial, like, hey, these deals were bad. You people got screwed. Now, of course, Donald Trump is not going to do anything to make this situation any better. He's not going to help these people. He's not going to uh, bring something new in that's going to turn central Illinois back into a you know great place to live or whatever. But you know, simply coming in and saying, I'm angry at the same people you are and saying out loud, I know that you've been screwed. I can see that these trade deals worked out badly for you. That was tremendously cathartic, I think, for a lot of people, especially contrasted with a message of, look, this is still our official policy. We embrace this. America is already great. That kind of messaging, you know, even Pete Buttigieg in 2020 said out loud into a camera, well, at least Trump didn't go around the country telling people America is great like Hillary Clinton did. You know, he had to grovel and apologize after he did that. But I think this recognition after 2016 that a lot of people don't think that things are going all that well in this country, a lot of people are actually pretty unhappy with it, has to somehow be worked into democratic messaging. They can't simply go around the country telling people, oh, yeah, the eight years of Barack Obama were an unfettered victory. Everything was great. Everything is great. And I vow to continue it. You have to acknowledge that a lot of people in a lot of parts of the country are really struggling. Right. So I guess that brings me, you know, to wrap things up a little bit to the questions about what's next. And you mentioned John Fetterman is an excellent candidate um, who is, I think, embodying a lot of the uh, the updates and the improvements that we want to see within the Democratic Party. What are some of mm -hmm. uh, your prescribed solutions for the many ailments uh, facing the Democratic Party? Well, I'm weak on solutions in chaotic neutral. I wrote a book where the intent was to get people to get to the end of it and see, look, for the past 30 years, what we've been doing is not working. It has not worked and it will not work if we keep doing it in the future. We need to do something different. A lot of the things that I do propose as far as making the Democratic Party more effective involve the kind of things it seems like they're waking up to now. Um, uh, consistently supporting things that working class voters, um, uh, you, know, you know, will help them with meet their basic economic needs. 
um, addressing problems that stemmed out of the Great Recession from the Obama era, like student debt, uh, which they, they finally started to do some things to address. Uh, but first and foremost right now, I think they have to let go of their embrace of institutions and norms as more important than political outcomes. Because as things stand right now, if they don't do something to change the jurisdiction or power of the Supreme Court or change the Supreme Court as an institution itself, or be willing to take the political risk of impeaching Brett Kavanaugh for lying multiple times under oath during his confirmation, you know, these basic sorts of things. If they don't do something about the Supreme Court and the federal courts, you know, as a whole, something structural, anything they do legislatively is likely to be of limited effect. You know, Joe Biden is going around um, saying the right thing right now, which is um, we're going to codify Roe versus Wade and abortion rights if Democrats come back with a majority. And I can just sort of picture Mitch McConnell sitting back and laughing and saying, well, good luck with that. You know, um, e- even if they manage to successfully pass legislation like that, we can all imagine what the Supreme Court is going to do. So unfortunately, um, the Democrats um, failed to get a grip on the problem before they got to a point where the Republicans now have a stranglehold on the Supreme Court. And without embracing things like, um, you know, adding additional justices to the court, expanding the Senate by adding a new state or something like, you know, they have to start doing something to uh, chip away at this stranglehold that the far right has gotten on the judicial process. And so far, their embrace of norms and traditions and institutions, you know, oh, we, we can't expand the Supreme Court. Well, why not? Why not? Uh, the, the number of justices on the Supreme Court has been changed multiple times throughout American history. Uh, the Constitution clearly gives Congress the right to do that. Why not? And uh, they have to start thinking outside of the box, and they have to start um, downplaying the role that norms and institutional rules and things like that play in their cosmology and be more open to the approach the Republicans have pursued, which is what rules do we need to change in order to get what we want, as opposed to the Democrats approach, which has been what can we get given the rules and things that we don't want to change that we're, we're working under. So it's a change in perspective that's going to be necessary more than any single political change, like, you know, nominate this candidate or right. support this policy. And it will fix them. they've dug themselves into a pretty deep hole here, and they're going to have to embrace some kinds of institutional reform and change um, in order to make political change possible at this point. Last uh, last question. How does embracing uh, the Democratic Socialist left, the squad left, how does that uh, fit into the healing that needs to happen? Because um, <laughs> you can't go a second without, say, someone like Debbie Wasserman Schultz throwing Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib under the bus, saying it's anti- yeah. they're anti-Semitic or, you know, distancing themselves from uh, Cory right. Bush. Like, w- w- how does that how does that fit into things? Because to me, there's a, I feel like an inherent dismissiveness of them, not just because of their politics, right. but because of the blue nature, the, ver- the, the deep blue nature of the districts that they represent, for example. Well, um, one of the things I'm emphatic Although about... I should, say, new to- I should say really quickly, that is not just... Dis- it's that dismissiveness doesn't apply to Nancy Pelosi, who represents San Francisco. Right. I continue. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I emphasize at the end of chaotic neutrals is that the Democrats are long overdue for leadership changes across the board. They have people who've been uh, seniority into these positions, essentially. And, you know, Nancy Pelosi is the speaker because Nancy Pelosi has always been the speaker and thus ever shall it be. You know, um, there, there needs to be, if not a farther left set of people who rise into leadership positions, at least someone who seems to understand how to integrate younger, more progressive the squad type Democrats into what the party needs to try to do rather than the current strategy, which is to make sure those people appear in all the photos on the website, you know, uh, but then expect them to go away and keep their mouths shut and, and, you know, say and do what they're told. So leadership changes, um, you know, when you have a party in flux and a party that's 
facing a lot of challenges right now, I think a leadership change is well overdue. You know, the, the top three Democrats in the House right now are 81, 81, and 82. Um, <laughs> I don't nuts. know a lot of political parties that do a great job of um, preparing for the future and overcoming immediate dire present challenges when their leadership are people who are pining for, you know, the way things were in Congress in 1989. Well, uh, Ed, Ber- Ed Bermilla, author of Chaotic Neutral, How the Democrats Lost Their Soul in the Center. Uh, Ed, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Of course. All right. Well, with that said, we are going to wrap up the first hour of this program, the free part of the sh- program, but you can get the fun half for free to watch it back at a later time if you become a member of the Majority Report. Uh, join the majority report.com. Please support this program. We uh, do not have billionaire benefactors, so we rely on your support to keep this show independent. Yeah, the pool full of MSNBC money is now really low. It's yeah. too low to dive in. So <laughs> It went all towards uh, towards that water cooler over there. So, um, so uh, please support us the if you can. air conditioner we used for about... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I look at that thing with such resentment. We had this, We had, as you guys un- maybe have followed, we had that air conditioner that uh, we could only run at 78 degrees, uh, and that was the, the lowest it could go because otherwise it would turn off the power. If we don't get a solution fixed next summer, I'm going to lose my mind because it was so hot in here in August. Anyway, uh, please support this program so I don't die of a heat stroke next summer. Join the majoritareport.com. Matt, what is happening in the Matt Luckian media universe? Uh, yeah, this weekend for a, a Left Reckoning patrons, patreon.com slash Left Reckoning, talking to Gene Bajlan, old TMBS crew, about the protests in Iran, the Kurdish angle of uh, the protests, and uh, why everything isn't a uh, CIA psyop, uh, and why like people need to be a little bit less knee-jerk about uh, certain reductive um, conclusions they draw on protests around the world. Ah, all right. Yeah, I, I listened to a little bit uh, of, of that episode. It's much listened, so everyone check out Left Reckoning. And then today, on the Majority Report channel, we're doing ESVN OT, and Bradley and I are going to be giving our picks for the NFL weekend. Um, we went 1-1-1, one, one, and one. the both of us. The game that we picked opposite sides of, Bills and Ravens, was a push because uh, the spread was three points and the Bills won by three. I really thought I was going to get Bradley on that one, but uh, that was... And it ended up uh, it ended up being a wash for both of us. So big week for us because there's only a game difference in this competition between us that's heating up. Check us out, uh, ESVNOT, 4 p.m. Uh, on the Majority Report channel, but also subscribe to... Uh, ESVN show, youtube.com slash ESVN show. And we're going to start having some like even more great guests on. Plus, basketball's coming back. Hockey's coming back next week. I can't week. wait for basketball. Yeah. And Matt's going to come on at some point to talk some shit about basketball for sure. Um, so check us out and uh, support, that sh- support us on uh, Apple and Spotify. Rate us five stars, all that good stuff, please. All right. Do we have? We have the uh, seamless. Look at that. Look at look that, at that transition. Wow. Hey, the Candyman can. What's happened, guys? <laughs> Nothing much. I, I want to pre-apologize for any uh, internet issues that I have. I don't know. I think the storm knocked something out near me, and so I see an optimum truck outside. I'm I'm frightened. We'll we'll see what happens. All right. Oh, the well, storm has hit where you are, Brandon. QAnon is there. He's uh... oh, <laughs> Q. Uh, Q is everywhere. That's that's, that's the that's the uh, that's the secret. Q is Quetzalcoatl. I don't know what that means, but um, mm. sure. Uh, so, what's happening over on the discourse, Brandon? Before your internet goes out, plug your show. Uh, what's happening up on the discourse? We should have a new episode for you up our bi yearly episode. Uh, for all of you who follow, uh, bi yearly means twice a year, not every two years. Uh, so we should have our bi episode up on SoundCloud for you, uh, sometime later this week. Okay, very nice. And Matt Binder, hello, my friend. Uh, what's happening on your two excellent shows? Oh, I thank you. Well, on Tuesday, I had uh, Mike Figueredo of the Humus Report on, and we spoke about uh, a variety of things, Elon Musk and Twitter, and how maybe that's back on, maybe it's, we'll, we'll, we'll see. 
um, and why that is. And then his his rant on Ukraine, Russia, which, you know, uh, guy seems to be able to shoot himself in the foot, even when, you know, even even among the people who who like him. Uh, at one point, which is pretty amazing to see. And yeah, we spoke about a whole bunch of things. Uh, Herschel Walker. Um, so check that out. YouTube.com slash Matt Binder. And it'll be up shortly at DoomedCast.com. And then tonight on Scam Economy, it'll be uh, premiering at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we have a great episode where we speak with Bonnie Patton of the organization Truth in Advertising. And basically, uh, a few months ago, they sent out a mass legal notices to a variety of celebrities who were promoting NFTs without disclosing their, you know, their their deal with the NFT creator. And so we speak about we spoke about you know the the Kim Kardashian getting fined by the SEC earlier this week, <laughs> and uh, just the the, mm. the the rash of celebrities being paid to promote this stuff without disclosing it, and you know which agencies are going to step up, which agencies are going to continue continue, excuse me, to look the other way. Uh, it's an episode all about celebs and the scam economy tonight. YouTube.com slash Matt Binder and up as a podcast at scameconomy.com. Um, Binder, have you seen The Anarchists on uh, on HBO? I have not. I have. I think okay. I've talked about it in the past, yeah. but I just yeah. watched it over the weekend. You would love it. You would love it. It's all, you know, it's anarcho-capitalists and crypto documentary that follows this conference over five years. It's nuts. It's totally made for you. Oh you got to see all it. Right. I have to... Damn, I dropped the ball not, not watching it. Yeah, I got it. It almost... And I want to say that I want to really provide the heavy caveat that you can accuse anarcho capitalists of a lot of things and have it be pretty fair. But I would say it's almost unfair to describe the people in the show as anarchists yes. because from what I watch, they are mostly just disaffected suburban people who but don't that's the like, point, I think, yeah, right? Like, that's their idea of yeah. anarchy. Like they 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 have a house in the suburbs, Georgia. Tennessee, and then they find out that you're not allowed to just dig a big hole in your yard because there are gas lines that run, gas lines that run through, and suddenly they won't believe in freedom. And, then, yeah. and then what happens when you what happens when those people move to like a cartel uh, playground? And yes. and, and you know, except for that one cool couple that like was fleeing marijuana charges in the U.S. That's the one. That's the one. That part. couple is you know that that's just a, a roller coaster. I will say my favorite part about the, the show is how they're you know they're libertarians but really that just means they they read ayn rand and so they all have the same pseudonym john galt but just different versions of it like oh, john Galton up on or, that. or juan galt or like jonathan galt and they all go by that as like their pseudonym even for a documentary it's like okay well that shouldn't be allowed yeah uh, I, that makes them less <laughs> me less invested in their story but i don't want to spoil anything there um you definitely should check it out binder and if you guys haven't checked it out in the audience uh you you should as well six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty we'll be taking your calls in the fun half see you there three months from now six months from now nine months from now and i don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now and i don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now but i think around 18 months out we're going to look back and go like wow what what is that going on it's nuts wait a second hold on for hold on for a second emma welcome to the program Hey. Fun hack. Matt. You. Fun hack. What is up, everyone? Fun hack. No, me key. You did it. 